Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth week of Horse Judging from Home. We're excited to have Kaylee Vandekamp, a graduate student at MTSU and an MTSU alumni, uh, and also an alumni of the Tennessee 4-H Horse Program joining us today to talk about equitation and horsemanship. Um, and so before I turn it over to Kaylee, um, just a couple quick things. If you all have uh, any questions that you'd like to submit during the webinar, please use the Q&A feature. Um, we'll be answering them live. Um, we have Dr. Holly Spooner also here with us from MTSU, who will be helping me field those questions um, throughout the day. And again, my name is Jenny Ivey. I'm an assistant professor here at UT. And so if you have any other um, ideas for webinars or things that you'd like to see us offer, uh, we stuck it in the Q&A section, but please send those ideas to me at jzivey, I-V-E-Y, at utk.edu. We'll be looking um, to be able to get some additional webinars up and running for you um, during the course of the summer. And so stay tuned and keep checking our Facebook page um, for some of that information along with utcourse.com. And so uh, also uh, we have posted within the uh, YouTube playlist the videos that Kaylee will be sharing within her presentation today. So if you use the link that we've put both in the chat and the Q&A feature um, and scroll down to the bottom, these last three videos here are the ones that Kaylee will be referencing. So again, if your internet is a little spotty or it's coming through um, difficult to see, open YouTube in a separate window um, and put that link in there and you'll be able to watch them separately to be able to see um, what Kaylee is sharing. And so, Keely, if you don't mind, you can share your screen and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, like Dr. Ivy said, my name is Kaylee Vandingham, and I am a proud alum of the Tennessee 4-H as well as MTSU. I'm currently Still studying at MTSU, I'm a master's candidate in equine education, and I'm happy to help Dr. Spooner as the assistant coach of the judging team. So today I'm going to talk to you about horsemanship and equitation, excuse me, horsemanship and equitation, and a little bit about how to judge them. So I'm going to be talking about it from the AQHA perspective, and the AQHA came out with a new scoring system in 2019, so that's kind of been where we're moving this year. So I'm going to be discussing it from that perspective. If you're judging in another association, you will definitely want to check. But to begin with, we're going to ask, what is Western horsemanship? So Western horsemanship is a pattern class, or a, it's a class on, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous today, but uh, it's a pattern class in the AQHA where the horse and rider are supposed to work in unison to perform a specific set of maneuvers set forth by the judge. So this is a little bit different from the ranch riding that Dr. Spooner talked to you all about a couple weeks ago. So if you weren't there, she mentioned that the ranch riding has a cup, probably has about 15 patterns that you can use and it'll work from, or you'll be scored from a negative one and a half to a plus one and a half. So this works a little bit differently and we'll get into kind of how it's scored in a minute. But to begin with, I'm gonna discuss about what we're looking for in the Western Horsemanship. So the Western Horsemanship was originally created to evaluate the rider's ability to do a set of maneuvers with precision and smoothness. The goal is for the rider to be poised and confident while riding correctly. So the AQHA rulebook specifically says that the rider must exhibit poise and confidence while maintaining a balanced, functional, and fundamentally correct body position. And in just a second, we're gonna talk about what that fundamentally correct body position is. The ideal horsemanship pattern. So this is the pattern that they'll be performing, what I talked about a little bit about how they have a couple maneuvers they're supposed to do. So the ideal horsemanship pattern should be precise. And the horse and rider, again, should be working in complete unison, executing each maneuver with very subtle or small aids and cues. So the ideal position for the horsemanship, we're gonna start at the top and kind of work our way down. So their head should be up and square above their shoulders. Their eyes should be looking where they're going. 
Your back should be straight and flat. There shouldn't be a whole big arch in it. Sometimes riders get nervous or tip their pelvis forward just a little bit and create an arch through their back. Their arms and hands should be up kind of at a 90 degree angle. Your rein hand can be a little bit softer to create more of a line from your elbow to the bit. Your reins should maintain contact the entire time. So in a minute, we're gonna talk about penalties. And one of the penalties is actually a loss of contact from the rider's hand to the bit. The rider's seat should be centered in the saddle or centered over the horse's back and steady. The thigh to knee to calf should all be connected to the horse. Your knee should never become loose. There should never be any daylight, as one of my coaches likes to say, between the horse and your leg. Your feet should be securely in the stirrup with the ball of your foot in the stirrup and your heel dipping down below that stirrup. When you go to the rail for maybe after your pattern and go onto the rail and do a little bit more work, you should maintain the same position and if you drop your stirrups or are asked to drop their stirrups, you should also maintain the same position. If you'll notice on the rider here, I've drawn a red line from her ear through her shoulder, through her hip, down to the back of her heel. So a really quick way to determine if your rider is kind of checking all these boxes here is to see if they have a good straight line, kind of like the one that this rider has. This shows that her head is up and squarely above her shoulders. Her shoulders are open and back, putting them directly above her hip. And her heel is back far enough to be effective and under her, um, excuse me, under her hip there. So here's a couple of examples. On the picture all the way to the left, this rider has a really good line from her ear to her shoulder to her hip to her heel. And if you'll notice, she's not got her stirrups, but is still maintaining that really nice, really secure seat position. In the middle picture, you have a rider on a Palomino there. Her heels are down really well, but if you'll notice, they're in front of that line there and almost up by her girth, so her heel doesn't fall right behind her uh, hip there. In your final picture, all the way on the right, on the black horse, so her shoulders are out, out past her hips, and her leg is also not quite as far back as I'd like to see it. It's not quite in that line. Additionally, this rider has her arms pushed all the way forward. There's no nice bend in them, and she's not maintaining great contact with her horse there. Okay, so the hunt seat equitation is actually really similar with a couple of changes, like the saddle maybe. Our hunt seat equitation class is also a pattern class. And this purpose is just a little bit different. So the idea here is that the rider should go on to an equitation over fences class. So the AQHA rulebook again says that the maneuvers of this class should provide a base for a natural progression to the overfences classes. Again, the communication should be really subtle and small, and the equitation is judged on the rider and their effect on the horse. So I'm going to talk a little bit about their position and how it's different. You should still see a lot of the same ideas. Your eyes should be up and looking where you're going. Your shoulders should be back and open. Ideally, you're gonna maintain a similar line. Your hands are gonna be a little bit different in the equitation. In the horsemanship, you ride one-handed and your free arm kind of follows your rein hand. In the equitation, you should have two, rein, or two hands on the reins and you should follow that same line from your elbow to the bit, as you can see in the red here, maintaining contact the entire time. Now your leg here is described as being in a correct position. You should have enough bend in your knee. The AQHA rule book specifically says enough. And additionally, with the heel, you should have enough weight in your heel to sink down, but not break it. Again, your foot should remain in the stirrup and maintain contact with the bottom of the stirrup the entire time. Again, if you lose your stirrups when it's not called for, it's a penalty. 
Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because the equation always calls for diagonals. And sometimes that can be hard to see for people. But ideally, if you're tracking on the wall or on the rail, you should rise and fall with the leg on the wall, which is super easy to remember until you get out in the middle of the pattern and you don't know which way is really to the wall. So you should be posting on the opposite leg that your horse is bent. So if my horse is bent to the right, I should post on the left diagonal. And the idea is that that outside kind of step is gonna be longer and it's more comfortable to sit on the shorter inside step. So we'll talk just a little bit more about diagonals when we get to talking about patterns and describing how you kind of judge that in just a minute. So I picked three horses here at the canter to talk about position. That way you don't have to think about diagonals. Your very first one, all the way to the left again on that dark bay, has really nice position. Her eyes are up and she's looking where she's going. If you'll notice, she's actually in a double bridle. So she's maintained contact with that top rein and is not necessarily required to maintain as much contact with the bottom rein. Her leg is in a really nice position. Her heel is down and she's got a pretty decent line from her uh, ear to her shoulder, through her hip, through her heel. Our next horse here to the right in the middle on the red horse, she does a pretty good job of having a line from her ear through her shoulder, through her hip. Her heel to me is not far enough down. She's kind of got it flat there in the stirrup and her reins should be a little bit shorter so that her hands can be out in front of her a little bit better there. She's kind of got them in her lap, but still a pretty good rider. Our last horse all the way on the right. Her stirrups are probably too long, but she has a good step down into her heel. Um, a little bit more. Very specific look you're looking for. But in the horsemanship and equitation, there's a lot of emphasis put on the rider. So what should the horse look like? Well, their head carriage should be natural. It's very specific in that rule book that you want a natural head carriage through both of these classes. A lot of times they're allowed to have a little bit higher head carriage, not necessarily a high head carriage, but a little bit higher. They like for their pole to be just a little bit above the withers, especially in the equitation classes. A lot of times I think people wonder if movement of the horse is super important in this class. And I will say it is not, to me, the most important thing. However, if the movement affects the quality of the maneuver, I think that it is only going to make your score better. So by saying this, in the equitation, if you don't have a horse that has the flattest knees, I don't think that that should really reflect in your score. But if you have a horse that fails to drive from behind and doesn't have any power, he's automatically going to be a less balanced individual and it's gonna make it harder for the rider to ride, if that makes sense. So the horse's attitude or manners should be very pleasant. He should be very willing. Like we discussed earlier, you want it to be very precise, very clean, and that requires your horse being with you every step of the way. So if you say jump, you should say how high really. So, he should be attentive and willing to do whatever you're asking him to do. And I have a couple examples in just a minute that you can see a very sharp, really great horse. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the maneuvers you may be expected to see, and then I'll stop and uh, answer some of those questions I see them coming in. So some of the maneuvers you may see in the horsemanship will be the walk, the jog, and the lope. And ideally your pattern, especially at like a world show level or the Congress level should show both leads. You can also see extensions of the gate. So an extended jog or an extended lope. You should see pivots or you might see pivots, also known as turnaround, but that's more of a reigning term. So most of the time you'll see pivot. Most of the time in your horsemanship, it's going to be a pivot on your haunches. So that means that they're 
you should plant one of the back feet and your front feet should go around the hind quarter. You'll often see a back. You might see a lead change. They can call for either a simple or a flying. And you'll see a halt, as well as many transitions up, down, left, right, all those fun things. Okay, for the equitation, you have a walk, you'll have a trot, you should see both diagonals of the rider. You'll see a canter going at both leads. The equitation, you might see a sitting trot. You might see a two point. If you don't know what two point is, it's kind of the position that you take when you are going over a jump. You might see a hand gallop, which is kind of like the extension of the lope that we talked about, but ideally even a little bit more. You might see a pivot either on the forehand or on the hindquarters. So a pivot on the forehand is complete contrast to a pivot on the hindquarters. You're gonna plant a front foot and pivot the hindquarters around that planted front foot. And the equitation often, or the hunt seat, you will often see that, as well as maybe some on the haunches. You'll also see a back and you may see a lead change, either flying or simple again, and you'll probably see a halt. Okay, before I get into scoring, Jenny, were there any questions? I'm seeing people raise their hands. I think Dr. Spooner and I have been handling most of the questions throughout the chat. Um, okay. So just as a general comment, as you move through, if you could just talk about some of the, the ways that you might evaluate if a horse becomes maybe disobedient and doesn't halt, um, but you don't necessarily have to stop and answer those right now if you'll cover them um, later on. Sure. sure, I'll talk about that just a minute when we get to scoring. So, there we go. So we're gonna talk about kind of how these maneuvers and how the rider works together to end up with a specific score for the pattern. So like I said, this is a pattern scored pattern class. So you're gonna have your average of 70, kind of like you were watching running the other day with Dr. Spooner, but you move kind of up and down from there depending on if you're having good maneuvers or poor maneuvers. So in pattern scoring, this is straight out of a material so the exhibitor should perform accurately, precisely, smoothly, and with a reasonable amount of promptness. So that means that you want it to be correct. It should be precise, which is kind of another word for it, but even more uh, correct and really, what's the word I'm looking for? I think when they say precisely and accurately separately, they're kind of trying to enunciate or exaggerate how important that the correctness is. Make sure that all of your moves kind of flow together, kind of maneuvers, and a reasonable amount of promptness. So you want them to work through it, not really quickly, but without kind of going slow. Increasing the speed of maneuvers, however, should not happen if you're going to end up messing up in a maneuver. So you're going to get if you have a correct maneuver that's maybe a little slow than if you try and do a really fast maneuver and mess something up. So for example, if I'm doing a turnaround or a pivot, and I ask the horse to go to the left, and I know he's gonna whip around to the left, Really great horse. He's really great at pivoting. I can whip him around and get a very plus uh, maneuver, but if I know he's going to whip around and then kind of be weird with his head or kind of scoot out of it, I may get a poor horse. I have more speed than did something only at the end, if that makes sense. So, and in that middle point is the my horse has a really good turnaround and my horse has an okay turnaround and he gets around eventually. My horse is probably going to get a better score because he did it faster as long as it's correct. All right, so once again, we talked about the ranch riding a couple of weeks ago. 
So if you weren't, because this is a little different. So your ranch writing was a minus one and a half to a plus one and a half. Here we're gonna use minus three to plus three. So I'm gonna start at the top. Your plus three is an X giver. It is correct, it is precise, it is smooth, and often it has that little bit of promptness, that little bit of quickness in it. Your plus two is still very good. So you're still gonna have some really positive things incorrect. Maybe it's smooth, it's just not as quick as that plus two. Your plus one is gonna be correct. Probably be smooth, but you may be, you know, it's still good, but it's not the best thing I've ever seen. If I give something a zero, I generally see that it was, they did it correctly. It wasn't quick and it maybe wasn't perfectly smooth, but it got it done. Minus one is gonna be if, since we're talking about turnarounds, I keep coming back to that. If my horse has head as we turn around and it's not quick anyway, so it's just kind of poor. Minus two is very poor, so that's gonna be maybe if my horse kind of gets stuck or falls over his own feet as he's coming around. It's not fast, it's no longer smooth, it's maybe not size, he's not planting his foot. My minus three is extremely poor. So this is gonna be if he was really, really terrible. If he kind of walked in a circle, he was really salty about it. And when I say salty, I mean maybe um, through his head or was chomping on the bit, or was just not quite as mannerly as you'd like him to see and didn't really offer to do the maneuver well. So like we kind of discussed earlier, correctness, to me at least, is the most important part of maneuver scoring. So if it's not correct, I'm for sure not gonna give it a plus maneuver score. The next thing I kind of look at is the quality or the consistency of it. So first of all, I have to ask, well, did he extend his jog? Yes, okay, so we're correct. My next question is, is it quality? So is he really stepping out? Is he listening to the rider? Is he consistently extended? Does he not, is the horse made from an extended to kind of, they're a little lazy, so maybe they check back into jog a little bit and you have to push them on again to ask them to kind of really kind of jog. So I want that consistently consistently consistency wow uh next i kind of look at their degree of difficulty and the rider confidence i kind of look at those hand in hand so to me when a rider is really confident they're going to ride really well first of all and so we're going to go for it which high degree of difficulty so a higher degree often because of the added speed hey kaylee so, hey kaylee yep um, it sounds like your audio is getting a little more garbled. Do you have um, a different mic or um, another way to mute maybe something in the background? Um, I don't have another mic, but I can try moving to another room here. Okay. It just, every once in a while, you sound great, and then occasionally it cuts out. Um, and so, at least if we can <clears throat> try to keep it a little more consistent, because sometimes we can't hear you at all. Okay, just let me know if you can't hear me and I'll repeat it. No problem, that sounds better already. Um, and we'll just- Okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> cool. On... Sorry, my AC is broken, so my windows are open out there. Oh, you're okay. And um, if we have any other issues, I'll let you know, but hopefully that'll fix it. Okay, thank you. So the degree of difficulty, like I was saying, a lot of times is an increase of speed. So a lot of times when the rider is really confident in their horse's ability to go fast and then come back to them, they'll increase that speed a little bit more. They'll have a little bit higher degree of difficulty. It's kind of like what we were talking about in the turnaround when I said my horse I know can whip around, so I'm going to let him whip around. And that's kind of going to increase my score there. So a plus three maneuver is going to be correct. It's going to be consistently high quality and there's gonna be a high degree of difficulty. 
So I'm going to talk about penalties a little bit because you can have a really great run, but if you accumulate penalties, you're probably not going to win. So in this scoring system, we have uh, three kinds of penalties. You're going to have a three point, a five point, and a ten point. And we'll point out where to put those on your score sheet in just a minute. But it's important to know our penalties because unlike the ranch riding pattern, or unlike the ranch riding score sheet, it does not have penalties on our score sheets for the horsemanship, equitation, and showmanship. So our three-point penalties are going to be a break of gait at the walk or jog for up to two strides. So if I'm supposed to be jogging and my horse just loses enough cadence that he walks for a stride or two, he's going to get a three-point penalty and that's all. An over or under turn from an eighth to a corner turn is also a three-point penalty. So as we were talking about that pivot earlier, if I really whip it around but my horse doesn't quite stop right at that 360 mark and he goes an eighth of a turn or a quarter of a turn past it, that's going to be a three-point penalty. Again, if my horse is really slow and we get almost all the way around and I stop him an eighth of a turn early, that's going to be a three-point penalty. Another three-point penalty would be a tick or hit of the marker or your cone. So if as I come jogging past my cone on my way out of the arena, if I tick it, it's going to be a three-point penalty. Another three-point penalty would be obviously looking down to check your diagonals or your leads. So if I don't know what diagonal I'm on, I really need to feel for it. Because if I look down to check and say, am I on the left or am I on the right, that's going to be a three-point penalty. So our five-point penalties, there are a couple more on here. Not performing the specific gate or not stopping within 10 feet or three meters of the designated location. So we're gonna talk a little bit about patterns in just a minute to kind of help you guys understand that. But not performing a specific gate, so not doing a correct transition or stopping within 10 feet of a specific location. So this is a little bit more important when you have a lot of cones. If I'm supposed to stop at a cone and I don't stop within 10 feet of that cone, that's gonna be a five point penalty. So maybe this is kind of helping y'all with your questions about what if he doesn't stop? Well, if he doesn't stop within 10 feet, he's gonna get a five point penalty. So missing my diagonal, like we said, looking down to check for your diagonal is a three point penalty. But if you're missing your diagonal up to two strides, that's gonna be a five point penalty. Similarly, if you're on the wrong lead or you break gate at all at the lope, except if you're on the wrong lead, that's going to be a five point penalty. So if you take the wrong lead, you're going to get a five point penalty, but you're not going to get another one for breaking gate to fix it, if that makes sense. So like we talked about earlier, a break of gate at the walker jog for less than two strides is three points. After you hit two strides, that third stride is going to get you a five point penalty. I mentioned a little bit earlier too, if you lose contact between the rider's hand and the horse's mouth, you're going to get a five point penalty. If you lose your stirrup, you get a five point penalty. If you pick your foot up off of your stirrup and no longer touch the stirrup at all gates, any of them, except for when it's called for to drop your stirrups, you will get a five point penalty. If your horse's head is carried too low or behind the vertical while the horse is in motion and it looks like he's intimidated, you're also gonna get a five point penalty. So this is kind of where your horse is gonna kind of come into play along with you. You have to make sure that your horse has his head where it's supposed to be in that natural position. He needs to have his nose kind of on the vertical or just past it out instead of being behind the vertical. If your horse is behind the vertical, that means that his nose is kind of coming into too far, coming too close to his chest. So you want it to be kind of right on that vertical, or like I said, just tipped out. Our severe penalties are 10 point penalties. So if I drop my rein and the judge sees it, it's a 10 point penalty. If I miss my diagonal for more than two strides, so if I've posted more than two times on the wrong diagonal, that's a 10 point penalty. 
If I touch my horse at all, use of either hand to instill fear or praise, I cannot smack him for being naughty. I can't pet him for being good. Those will both get me a 10 point penalty. I can't hold the saddle with either hand. So I think like Dr. Spooner said a couple weeks ago, you are allowed to grab your horn in the ranch riding. It's not a thing here. You cannot touch the saddle with either hand. If you're using a Romel in the Western horsemanship, you cannot cue at the end of the Romel. You cannot kind of swing it and tell your horse to go on. That's not allowed. That's going to be a 10 point penalty. Blatant disobedience. So kind of like we talked about earlier, or like the question was earlier, if your horse is being really naughty, if he kicks at your spur, if he's pawing in the middle of the arena, if he bucks at any point, if he rears at any point, any other random blatant disobedience that's obviously the horse saying, I don't want to do that. It's a 10 point penalty for each time it happens. So if my horse paws three times, you might get three different 10 point penalties. Another 10 point penalty is spurring or cropping in front of the cinch. So when I take a crop, I'm allowed to hold a crop. I'm allowed to have spurs in both of these classes. I may not use my spur or crop in front of the cinch. I can't use it on the shoulder. I would have to use it on the haunches or on the hip behind me. Okay, one last big slide of words, I promise. Disqualifications, these are also important. So as a judge, you have to know what's going to disqualify a rider. The very first thing is failing to display a correct number. If I go in there with a number, but it's not mine, it's going to DQ me. If I go in without a number, it's also going to DQ me because they can't identify me correctly. Abusing your horse or excessive schooling will be a disqualification. If your horse falls, and the definition of falling is that the hip and shoulder both touch the ground at the same time. This is a disqualification. Illegal equipment or illegal hands on the reins. So I can't think of illegal equipment off the top of my head other than maybe an illegal bit. But if I'm riding in the horsemanship and I reach down and take two hands on my reins, that's a disqualification. Again, use of prohibited equipment, maybe an illegal bit. If I go off pattern, I will be disqualified. So this means if I go on the wrong side of the cone, if I knock a cone totally over, that's a disqualification. Like we said earlier, hitting or ticking it is just a minor penalty, but actually taking it out is a disqualification. If I never perform a designated gate, if I'm supposed to jog somewhere and I lope all the way through it and never offer to jog, I'm disqualified. Same thing with the wrong lead, same thing with the wrong diagonal. Again, if I over or under turn more than a quarter, that's going to disqualify me. Okay, moving on to reading a pattern. So hopefully this is all going to start coming together with, or all coming together when you see this in a pattern. So if you look on the right there, I have an example of a pattern. This is from a couple years ago, but it's still a good pattern. So if you'll look, I don't think there's actually a cone in this pattern, but usually it's important to note where your cones are and which side they're supposed to be on. So I'm gonna say our one and two here are gonna be our markers. So the one on the left side of the pattern is gonna be a cone and you should go with the cone on your left. On the other side of the pattern, the number two there, your cone should also be on your left. So a good way for me to remember this as a rider is that I would say I have to be in between the cones this whole time. Even as a judge, if I'm judging in a judging contest, a way for me to remember would be if this rider goes on the outside of the cones, they have to be disqualified. So looking at this pattern, you're going to walk 15 feet from that little number one. You see the little itty bitty dashes, that's your walk. The bigger dashes, the bold kind of dashes, is going to be an extended jog. So they're going to extend a jog up, make a hard corner to the right, to the center of the arena. They're going to stop and do a 360 to the right, then a 360 to the left 
left. Those are those little circles in the very center. The fourth maneuver, if you're following along, is to lope a left lead circle, building speed before collecting to the lope. So that thicker, bold circle going on the top half, they should be building into an extended lope there. You should collect when that line kind of comes back to that narrower line, right, as you come back to the middle. Change leads, flying or simple. And you're gonna lope a smaller circle to the right without losing cadence. I'm gonna continue on. Number six is lope a corner to the right. So I'm gonna lope straight out of that circle, hang a hard corner to the right. And I'm gonna break down to a jog, a normal jog. Jog all the way down to our little number two there. Stop and back two horse lengths. So a single horse length is about four or five steps. So I should back up eight to 10 steps from my little number two marker. And then I'll exit at a walk or jog. So the important thing there is that it says exit at a walk or jog. If it had said I have to exit at a jog, and you remember back to our DQs we just talked about, that would be a failure to exhibit a specific maneuver. So I would get DQ'd if I didn't jog off. Luckily though, this one says you can exit at a walk or jog. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about places in this pattern that you could increase your degree of difficulty, kind of like what we talked about. So if my horse goes through and does all of this correctly, I could get a zero all the way across all of my maneuvers and get a 70. But if I really want to get a good score, if I want to go to the world show and win, I'm going to have to increase my degree of difficulty to get some more plusable maneuvers. So I'm going to skip the walk for now. I have a video that talks about a walk in just a minute or briefly talks about the walk. My extended jog to the middle of the arena, that second maneuver with those big black dots excuse me, big black dashes. If I really send my horse and I say, we're gonna go trot so big, you might almost think about loping. As long as I don't lope, I might get a better score. As long as my horse maintains that same frame, maintains the same cadence, as long as I'm consistently riding really strong and straight. Another thing that might make me a little bit more plusable in my 360s, if my horse can separate both my 360s the same way. So if my horse is consistent both directions, I might be a little bit more willing to give him a plus there. Another thing would be a lope off. So our transitions here, you can gain credit. If my horse lopes off into a really, really pretty collected balance left lead circle and builds really nicely into a big open extended lope, that's gonna be more credit earning than my horse that kind of lopes off, takes a second to kind of gather himself into a correct lope, which is still correct, but then builds a little bit of speed, but I'm a little conservative because he might run off otherwise. That's not gonna be quite as credit earning as that earlier situation I discussed where I really go for it. Another thing that's gonna build my degree of difficulty here is having a really nice lead change. If my horse is straight, especially since this is coming through the middle, if you're tracking straight at the judge or straight away from a judge, they can for sure tell if your horse is going straight through here instead of at an angle. My collected lope, as long as my horse comes right back down to me, if I have to fight him at all, that's not gonna be credit earning. That corner, the lope corner, I think that's number six. If I can have a really crisp corner and I pick my horse up and we're tracking straight and then we're turning and going straight down again, that's gonna be more credit earning than if my horse ends up kind of making a little bit softer corner, almost making it more rounded. Breaking down to the jog, as long as your horse is right there with you, that can be really credit earning. Having a really prompt stop, if your horse stops square, that's a really pretty look. That can be a higher degree of difficulty. That can be more credit earning. And again, backing with a little bit of speed with your horse really right there in your hand and backing as you ask him to. All of those things can increase your degree of difficulty and ultimately increase your score. So here is a pattern class score sheet 
As you can see up there, there's a lot of numbers on here. So I'm gonna focus first on the left hand of the screen, kind of right under that AQHA. So the very first box all the way on the left is the working order, which will be very, very irrelevant in your judging contest because you're only gonna have four riders. But if I have 10, if I have 20, that might be helpful for me to go back and find who I'm trying to think of. Your entry number is gonna be the box right next to that. So again, when you just have four riders, it's gonna be one, two, and three, and four. But if I'm at the big world show, you might have rider number 1203 or something in there. Okay, right next to your entry number box, it describes how your rider is scored. So it's gonna be that minus three to a plus three, and it describes all of them there again, just like we talked about earlier. Right under that, there's numbers one through 10 and boxes under there to put maneuver descriptions. We'll talk about that in just another second. Under there, I have two more little boxes, and this should be right next to where I would put my entry number. My two little boxes, or my two rows of little boxes, the top one is gonna be my penalties, so hopefully those will be pretty empty but the bottom ones are gonna be my maneuver scores. So I should have something in every single one of those boxes that has a maneuver in it. So if I have nine maneuvers in my pattern, I promise I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a minute, but I should have scores all the way through that ninth little box on the bottom or on the bottom of number one. Okay, if you'll keep going past our 10 box, here, wait, I have a mouse, I can use it. Past our 10 box, there's something called F and E. We'll talk about that in just one more minute. There's another box that says total penalty. So if I picked up a couple three point penalties and a couple five point penalties, I'm gonna add them all up and put them there. And then I'm gonna add together all of my maneuver score, subtract all of my penalties, add my F and E score, and have your final score right there. So in our pattern class score sheet from the AQHA, you also have a ladder over here on the left. That can be really helpful when you have a lot of riders. In a judging contest, it's not gonna be quite as help helpful because you'll only have four riders, but your ladder allows you to put your numbers in. So if I have a rider that scores an 85, I can put their number there, an 84 right there, and so on and so forth. And that kind of helps me place it when I have 20 something riders that I'm trying to judge. One last thing I'm gonna draw your attention to is all the way down at the bottom, it says penalties and rider form and effectiveness. We're gonna talk about that F and E, I promise, in just a minute. But I wanna draw your attention to the penalties. This is the only place on your score sheet that it tells you what your penalties are at all. So it's really different from that ranch riding. You have to memorize your penalties. You have to know which ones are minors and majors and which ones are severe and what'll DQ you because it will not tell you otherwise. Okay, what the heck is F and E? I have heard this multiple times and a bunch of kids, at least that I've helped learn how to judge, wanna know if they have to use F and E. As a carded judge, yes, you do have to use F and E. If you are judging at your local 4-H show, I would recommend you use F and E and get used to it, but I suppose you don't have to. Rider F and E down at the bottom again is rider form and effectiveness. So in that little F and E box that we talked about next to your total penalties up here, right there, if you can see my mouse, you're gonna give them a score. So this is kind of a way to reward a rider that's really, rides really smart, maybe has a really great plan to her pattern, but maybe hit a little bumps along the way. So maybe your horse, was not cooperating super well, but she handled it and she still rode through it really well. This is a way that you can kind of reward them for that. So you can give them a score of zero to five. So if you give your rider a five in F and E, that means they were excellent. They were really, really great. They had a really great line from their ear all the way down to their, uh, the back of their heel. They had a really strong seat. They were confident in everything that they did. A four is gonna be very good. So they still maybe had that really great line, but just lacked a little bit of confidence. You would have liked to see them have a little bit more confidence. You might give them a four. Your good is gonna be two to three. 
so that has a little bit more of a range so you might be good leaning towards very good and give them a three or you might be good leaning towards average and give them two your average score is going to be zero to one so if they really just stayed on you might give them a zero to one but other than that you maybe want to give them some credit there all right so like i said I have an example here for you and I'll have a video to go along with this. So if this is not making any sense, I'll show you a video of somebody actually writing this in just a second. So the very first one, the first maneuver here in this uh, pattern on the left is a walk. So this is kind of how I would lay out this pattern on my score sheet if I were getting ready to judge it in a contest. So I would say the very first maneuver is a walk. Next, they're supposed to extended jog all the way up through here, up to that kind of swirly thing up there. They're gonna stop, do one and a half turns to the left. That's what this turn here, the swirly thing looks like. That's your turn and a half. Next, our maneuver number four is gonna be jog. So they should jog out of that turn and then turn a corner here. So you can see there in my maneuver number four, I just put jog because these are little boxes, but I know that they should turn the corner and that's all gonna be that one maneuver. My fifth maneuver is to lope off on the left lead and move up into an extended pace. So, or an increased pace, that's an extended lope. So here I put LL, I know that's left lead lope, you're gonna make up your own shorthand and it will work really well for you. If this doesn't work for you, don't worry about it, make your own. And I put EXT on the bottom for extended. So I know that he should be building into, or he or she, sorry, should be building into that extended lope. Your sixth maneuver is gonna be collected. So he should collect. My X is a lead change. So when I put an X in my box, I know they should be doing a lead change. And if you'll notice, there on the left where you see an X kind of in the center, that's also the, um, the sign or the, um, wow, I'm drawing a blank on the word. That's where you should do a lead change, I'm sorry. So you're gonna lead change and then go onto your right lead lope. So my box number seven there just says RL, so that's right lead. And then I have simple change. So I've denoted simple change with an SX so that I know that they have to do a simple change. And I put walk underneath because it specifically says simple change of leads through the walk. So that's really important. If they simple change through the trot, they're failing to do that maneuver correctly. They failed to perform the walk, which means they're gonna DQ or disqualify. My number nine is gonna be back to the left lead lope. And my number 10 maneuver here is going to be stop 360 to the right. And then you exit at the walk or jog. So I'm going to pull up a YouTube video here. This should be the first one. Hoping that it'll pull up okay. Whoa, don't I'm saying that it's from 2016. So he says a little bit different kind of scoring system. He says check and plus. Just know when he says check, he's giving her a zero for correct. And when he's saying plus, he's giving her some kind of credit. Okay? Here we go. All right, here we have the select amateur Western horsemanship final. I believe this is draw one. Again, looking for a horse and a rider, I should say, that is uh, just looks presenting, presenting themselves very nice, very confident. And we definitely fit this criteria here. Very nice walk. Commanding of it, not scared of it. Didn't go over aggressive. I checked past that. 
this is tended to try to get the rider has a lot of feel a lot of connection show me good connection through her lower leg Brand stays in the saddle plus the extended jog turn around i'd like to see a little bit more cadence in it definitely not negative jog same thing i'd like to see a little bit more cadence definitely not a negative Rider so well, I check both of those maneuvers. This rider in my mind right now is looking to be in that excellent category. Very, very nice extended low. Definitely a plus here. Moving up in my book. Sets up for the lead change. Horse is patient, waits for the rider to act, changes leads nicely, stays centered. Again, right as she comes to that walk, asks for that walk, that horse responds. Rider sits up, never loses contact with her horse. Leg stays good. Left lead connected, right turn, very nice. Plus those maneuvers. Excellent ride, excellent performance. Okay, so if you'll notice, he said some of those fun words that I like. He said she was connected, so she never lost her connection both from her leg or to her horse's bit. She was confident the whole time. She sat up and she was looking where she was going. She sent her horse on. She trusted him to do her job, so he probably got some credit for having a higher degree of difficulty. I'm not sure what he put for an F&E because that wasn't really a thing in 2016, but she probably got a four or a five. She was really great rider. So we're gonna do the same thing for the equitation now. I have an equitation pattern here for you. So the very first maneuver, and these are broken up a little bit differently than they are on the pattern here, so don't worry. My first maneuver I say is a right diagonal, posting trot right diagonal for half of the line. So we're gonna start here. You'll see that little start cone. And you're gonna posting trot on the right diagonal halfway up that line. Then you're going to change diagonals to the left diagonal and trot all the way up and around the end, breaking to a walk without losing forward motion. So that's your third maneuver is going to be your walk. The fourth maneuver on my score sheet, the third maneuver on the pattern is going to be a right lead canter. So after you walk a couple steps, you're going to pick up your right lead canter and canter around the end of the ring. Perform a lead change in the center. Your fifth maneuver on your pattern, I have it as my sixth maneuver here, is gonna be a hand gallop. So after I change leads, I'm gonna kind of build into that extended canter. My rider's gonna get up out of her tack, not quite in two point, but hand gallop up and around. Then I'm gonna collect the canter here. This pattern's a little off, it has a trot there, but that's okay. I'm gonna collect my canter for half of this line. Then I'll perform the sitting trot from half of that line down to a halt right back at that start cone. This pattern does not have a back, so then you'll just exit at the walk or a trot. So if that doesn't make sense, don't worry, I have another video. So this is like another judge. It's from 2016, so again, if they say a little bit weird on the scoring there, just know that a check is a zero, and if they give it a plus, they've given it credit somewhere. Relax arm 
and that's the problems to the power of Western forces. Just really change here. You can see your focus is being to the center of the room. The very smooth change. I did give the girl a pause on that change. Um, I hope that check. And then here she gets to her good point. I do like the way she opened to start up and starts looking at the back. You know, like you were talking about, so it's separated this from the power for me. Um, I can right there, and she has a recollection of the hand. And then down to the same time, which is nice forward and even. And so the ball, all in all, that was my hot rod. And it was very all in. So, a little bit about the smoothness that she showed. She definitely had one. A lot of confidence there for me. She followed the plan that she made. He mentioned she took a second to really shake her horse to that turn. That says confidence to me. She knows what she wants her horse to do, and she's confident enough to wait until he does it to move on. A really great rider. That was actually one of the pictures that I picked that we talked about position earlier. She really had the same position throughout the whole pattern. Even as she came down into the sitting can sometimes be a little bit difficult. She really did a great job of maintaining that really straight, really steady, really strong position. Jenny, do we have time for a practice class? This is about seven-ish minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm, okay. if we go a little bit over, it'll still be on the recording if those have to leave um, that they can access later. So that would be great. And remember, okay, for those of you that are having trouble with um, the streaming audio, remember that these are posted on the uh, UT Horse YouTube channel, and so you can access them there um, and stream just from your own device if it's chopping through the webinar. Okay, so this practice class that I have, unfortunately didn't have a, a pattern, like a picture of a pattern. So I went ahead and drew, kind of wrote it out here for you. So you'll be able to kind of follow along as we go. Uh, the first maneuver is going to be a jog. This is kind of laid out. You'll see it. We can go through the first rider and I'll come back and play it again. That way you kind of have an idea for it. The first maneuver is going to be a jog. The second maneuver there, it says extended jog O. That means there should be an extended jog circle. And that happens at the second cone. So they'll jog at the first cone. At the second cone, they should show you an extended jog circle. At that same cone, as they close their extended jog circle, they should collect their horse into a collected jog circle or a normal jog circle. After their normal jog circle, they're gonna be in a square corner. They're gonna extend a jog in between the two square corners, square corner again, all the way to the third cone. We're gonna stop and do one and a half turns to the left. After they do one and a half turns to the left, they're gonna pick up their left lead and lope down towards the camera kind of. At the third cone or fourth cone there, as they lope down, they should show you an extended lope circle. After extended lope circle, they should collect and show you collected or normal lope circle. Then they're gonna stop and back and then they can either walk or jog off. So I'm going to pull this up and we're going to watch the first one, just to kind of get a feel for the pattern in case you're going to do this. And then we're going to go and do the first one again. And then you can go back and forth. So this is going to ride number one in just a second. But the color sheet is the first one. Thank you. 
Hey Kaylee, hey, just to let you know, you're really cloudy or breaking up. I think you're fighting for some inner space with your video. Okay. And stopping back. So I'm going to go ahead and start that over. And that'll be your number one horse if you want to practice. I'm not going to watch the rail work on this class because I think you all know what rail work looks like. It looks just the same. You're just going to judge your rider a little bit this time. So we'll go ahead and play this. Dr. Spooner said this is a little choppy. So if y'all want to go and watch that other link, uh, either after this or later, what I'm gonna do is go through and kind of talk about how I scored them. And you can maybe pull up that uh, video next to it, like Dr. Ivy kind of talked about, if you wanna see kind of what I was scoring as they go through the pattern. So first of all, I'm gonna do a quick little screen grab of each of the riders. We're gonna talk about them for just a second. So the number one rider does a really good job. She's kind of consistent the whole time. I'm gonna draw lines on them for you, just so you kind of see where that kind of lays out how we were talking about earlier when I drew lines on those horses earlier. So our first rider does a good job. Her head is just a little bit in front of our line there. But other than that, she goes really great through her shoulder, down through her hip, all the way through her heel. Your number two rider, she's got her red vest on. So over here on the right side of your screen, she does an even better job. Her ear is right under that line, all the way through her shoulder, through her hip, and right through that back half of her heel. Really pretty line. Our third rider does a good job through her shoulder and her hip, but her leg gets out in front of her just a little bit. And you can see she's turning to look, but her head is about where it's supposed to be. Our fourth rider here, I drew a line through her shoulder and her hip, and that's fine. But her seat is maybe a little far back in the saddle, and that's leaving her head kind of in front of her line, and her leg also way out in front of her. So if you want to go and watch the uh, first rider go through, I'm going to kind of talk through it here. And keep in mind, this is if I'm judging it for a judging contest. If I were judging at the world show, they probably wouldn't get quite such big scores because they'll have a lot more competition. But we'll talk about this first. Our rider number one with the blue vest on, she had a very fine job. I gave her a plus one. It was correct. He did it when she asked her to. For him to get a little bit more credit, I probably would have liked to see him in frame a little bit better, maybe a little bit more connection through the reins there. Our extended jog circle, I went ahead and said minus one because he really didn't show me, he showed me an extension but made a really small circle. So for me to give him a little bit more credit there, I would have liked a little bit more extension from him. And then I really would have liked a bigger circle. Our third maneuver there, the collected jog circle, I gave it a zero because he did collect his jog, but he gave me the exact same size circle. Again, for him to be credit earning, I really would have liked for there to be a more of a distinction between the extended jog and the collected jog. Our two square corners in the extension there, I gave a minus one. It was okay, but again, he really wasn't connected to her through the reins. It was correct. I really would have liked for that second square corner to be a little bit sharper, but it was okay. His turn and a half to the left was really nice. I can tell he's probably a little Rainer type because he really whipped around there. So I gave him a plus two. Really to me, the only thing that could have made it a plus three would have been having in a little bit more frame as we ended that 
uh, turn and a half. His left lead lope, I gave a zero. I would have liked to give him credit, but he really threw his head as he loped off and just never quite came back into the frame that I wanted him to do. But he still was loping. It was the left lead. It was correct. It was fine. Just wasn't really credit earning to me. Our seventh maneuver, the extended lope, I gave him a plus one. She really did extend it. He really went for it. Uh, to get more credit there for me, I would have liked for it to be a more correct circle. I think it kind of ended up being an oval or an egg shape. I don't remember because I'm not watching it right now, but I know it wasn't quite a circle. Um, I gave him plus one on the collected lope. Also, I think that was a little awkwardly shaped circle. And again, I would have liked for him to be in a little bit better frame, a little bit more connected to the rider there. I gave him a plus one on the stop and back. I think he was a little sassy when she asked him to stop, but then his back was really nice. So he gained credit for the back, which maybe would have been um, less than credit earning for the stop. For her F and E, I gave her a two. I said she was good, plenty fine. She maybe could have had a three. Like it was very acceptable. She didn't have any penalties. It was a good ride. I gave her a 76 in this horse judging contest kind of context. So our rider number two came in. She's got on a red vest. I gave her a plus two on her jog. I thought that she was a little bit more confident in her jog. The rider had her head up a little bit more. She just appeared a little bit stronger as she jogged in. Also, her horse was a little bit more connected. They were in a little bit better frame. Her extended jog circle, I gave her a plus one. I thought she really used her space there and made it a good big circle. Again, I would have liked to see just a little bit more extension out of her to give her more credit. A similar thing on the collected jog, she did a good job and made it a smaller circle. Um, but again, a little bit more variation there would have been more credit earning in both of those maneuvers. I gave her a zero on the square corner and extended trots, um, or excuse me, extended jog. I thought it was correct. There was nothing there that really said it was outstanding or excellent. Um, again, I would have liked to see that second square corner a little bit sharper. Um, I probably would have given her a plus one if she had made that really crisp. Uh, turn and a half to the left, I gave her a plus one. Again, kind of a little rain or pony. Had a little bit less cadence than our last horse. And since I gave our last horse a plus two, I said, well, you have to have a little bit less because it wasn't quite as good. So she got a plus one. I plus one her left lead lope off. I thought he stayed connected the whole way from the second she asked him to lope off. I plus one her extended lope. I thought she did a good job of really sending him and showing me an extension. Um, again, I think that she got a little bit loose, the rider, I mean, got a little bit loose there, and that kind of kept me from giving her a whole lot more credit there. Um, her collected lope, I gave her a zero. I think maybe her horse's head came up a little bit out of frame, and that's probably why I didn't give him a lot of credit. The stop and back, I gave a plus one, just like that last horse, real similar kind of attitude there. Uh, the f and &E, I gave a three. Again, I probably could have given her three or four-ish there. But that total ended up as an 81. Again, no penalties, really clean, really good ride. Uh, again, if this were the world show, she maybe wouldn't have gotten an 81. But if I'm judging for a contest, I need to score big enough, and put my scores big enough that my riders separate themselves out. Uh, my rider number three, I said, yes, you did jog. I will give you a zero. She didn't do anything wrong, but she really didn't do anything to catch my eye like that last rider. I thought she just jogged in so nicely that this one kind of was lackluster for me. Um, our extended jog, I gave her a plus one. Um, I think if I'm remembering this right, since I'm not watching it right now, I think she did give me some extension, but maybe not quite as much as I wanted. Our collected jog, I think she did fine, just maybe was kind of an awkward circle, wasn't quite as round as I wanted it to be. So I told her, you know, it's correct, we'll give you a zero. Our two square corners, again, I said, zero, it's correct. And I, like, to me, a zero is fine. I don't mind getting a zero on my score because that means I didn't do anything wrong. Our turn and a half to the left, again, I was kind of surprised everything about this horse had been kind of average, but that was pretty cute. So I let him have a plus one there. 
I zeroed our left lead lope. I think he just wasn't as connected as I wanted him to. He really didn't step under himself as he loped off. So I just said, you know, she did the left lead. She did do the thing. So you get a zero. Um, the extended lope, I gave her a minus one. So I think this is maybe the first time I, no, I did minus one on one, the rider one. But here, I just really felt like she didn't extend the lope. Like she made a bigger circle, but really just, I wanted there to be more there. It really wasn't even correct because it was that same steady lope. So her collected lope circle, I could almost have hit her there a little bit and lost some credit there because there was no change. But I gave her a zero. I said, well, you know, you matched that first leftly lope that you would probably have had as a collected lope. So we'll say a zero. Stopping back, I also said zero. It was fine. There was nothing wrong with it, but there also wasn't anything brilliant with it. So this is our rider in the yellow vest and her leg kind of stayed out in front of her the whole time. So I gave her a two. I said, you know, you did a fine job. You stayed on top of your horse. You rode the pattern for the most part correctly. You were good enough. So you get a two. So that brings her to a 73. Now our fourth rider, and I don't remember what vest she had on. I want to say green, but I don't want to be wrong. So she came in at the jog, was kind of similar to me, to our last rider, maybe even a little bit less confident, but I gave her a zero, you know, give her the benefit of the doubt. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but I gave her a zero and I said, well, okay, you jogged in, it was fine, we'll get a zero. Her extended jog um, was a little inconsistent. I felt like his, he was really out of frame. There was really no connection there between her hand and the bit. So I said minus one. I gave her another minus one on the collected jog circle because she became really inconsistent there. Her jog was just almost walking at times and then was really jogging and just wasn't really what I was looking for when I wanted a collected jog. Her two square corners, gave her a zero on that. I was like, okay, well, maybe this will, it'll get better. It'll be fine. She's doing a good job extending there. It was a really good trot. Not really good, but you know, she did the thing. Her turn and a half left again. I think these are all kind of Rainer-ish or maybe ranchier horses. They all had a good turnaround, so I gave her a plus one. She got around real cute. The left lead lope, I gave her a zero. I maybe could have given her a minus one because he really is just consistently out of frame and not quite where I want him to be. The extended lope, I gave her a minus one really think that she could have gone for it. There was no extension whatsoever. Her circle was really kind of a wonky shape. It wasn't really a zero, or excuse me, it wasn't really an, a circle. Um, her collected lope, I gave her a zero though. It was fine. The stop and back, I gave her a minus one. I think it was a little bit slow. There were a couple of these maneuvers now looking back on it and remembering it, I maybe could have hit her a little bit harder for maybe could have given her a penalty for being out of frame and losing contact um, with a bit. But overall, I mean, it was fine. But again, wasn't my favorite rider. If you remember those lines that I had drew out, she was kind of, her shoulders were tipped forward just a little bit. Her head was out in front of her. Her legs were out in front of her. Not the most confident rider, not the prettiest rider. So I gave her a one on her F and E for a total score of 68. So I think that this class kind of lays itself out really well for you if you've not, oh, didn't mean to do that, lays itself out for you really well if you've not judged before or not judged the horsemanship before. I think your two horse is an easy winner. If you check your scores again, your number one horse is several points behind her. It's not a super close class in any way. Your one horse does fine, gets through it pretty well, is pretty credit earning. Your two horse is really nice, had a really great rider. Your third rider was closer to average, ended up with a 73, and your fourth horse was a 68. So once again, if this were the world show, I probably would hit them harder for a couple things, maybe given a little bit less credit. But for a judging contest, you have to separate your horses out. Because if you don't, you end up with ties. So in the AKH AQHA rulebook, the way to break your tie is on the rail work. So you'll watch your riders go do their pattern. You'll score them all the way out. And you get to the end and you have two riders maybe that both have a 72. So your tiebreaker is going to be that rail work. You're going to evaluate them on the rail and decide which one is the better rider, which one has the better connection with the horse, 
all those fun things. The next thing I'm going to say is the benefit of the doubt. So if I'm not totally convinced in my mind that this horse has disqualified itself or taken a 10 point penalty. So like if I'm, I can't really tell if he overturned more than a quarter or not, and it maybe was just right at the corner or at the one quarter, I might just give her a penalty instead of disqualifying her. Because if for some reason I disqualified them and they pull up their video and they're like, I didn't get disqualified, it's not really a fun place to be. So always, always, always give them the benefit of, your, of the doubt, whether that's in the horsemanship or the equitation or any of the other pattern classes. I find that if you give them the benefit of the doubt, you're usually okay. So I just have one or two tips for judging this quickly because these classes tend to go really quick, especially when you're judging them in a contest. So if I don't know a specific penalty, if I don't remember if it's a three or five point penalty, but I know that it's a penalty of some sort, I might put a little X in my penalty box or some kind of mark in my penalty box so that I remember that they did something there and that it, even if I don't know what it is at that moment, once I have a second to go back and look at it, I can flip through my rule book and go find what that penalty is exactly. Another thing is to keep your eyes up and that kind of ties back into that hole, just make a little mark and then keep watching. If I look down to look for my penalty that I found, I might miss that they DQ altogether. So it's really important to keep your eyes up, keep watching, keep scoring, even if you get off a little bit, you can fix it later, I promise. My last tip for quick judging is to know the rule book. And this is super important all the way across the board in all of the classes that you're judging. If I know the rule book forward and backward in whatever class I'm judging, I know all the penalties, I can judge faster, I can judge more correctly when I know what I'm, when I know the rules, I know the penalties, I know what's expected. This is also important if you are judging across different associations. So if you're judging in the AQHA and the Arabian Horse Association and maybe the Ponies of America, I know those have a little bit different uh, penalties and stuff. So as long as you know the rule book, look through the rule book before you go into it, you will be totally, totally fine. I hope this helped. I hope you learned something. And um, if there are any questions y'all haven't answered, Dr. Ivy, if we've got time, I'd love to answer them. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That was great. Um, and we really appreciate you taking time to share your insight with us and teach a little bit more about judging horsemanship and equitation. Um, I think Dr. Spooner and I have cleaned up the Q&A section. Um, and so if you all have any additional questions, um, feel free to, to email us, but I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Thanks so much. Thank you.